Wow, good morning. It's so great to see you. Thank you for braving the rain. And uh, if you got a little bit of wet, then that's all right. It'll dry out by the time we get through this morning. But we're glad that you're here. Are you glad to be here? Ah, good, good, good. We want to welcome you. We want to welcome those that are watching online. Say welcome to you. Thank you for coming and being a part of our worship experience today. I want to remind you, if you're a guest for the very first time, if you'll look at the screen, there is a QR code, and you can use the camera on your smartphone to register and let us have your contact information. We'd love to contact you this week and let you know how glad we are that you attended and say welcome to First Baptist Church. We'd love to have more information about you and provide with for you more information about the church. So use that QR code. The other thing I want to remind you about is all of the sermon notes are available this morning and, all, and every morning on the First Baptist FBC Waxahachie app. So if you've not downloaded that on your phone, uh, it'll help you to have the sermon notes and fill in the blanks as the pastor goes through the sermon in a little bit. So anyway, take just a little bit to do that and uh, you'll be all caught up. Now, very excited to let you know we're going to start the service with a baptism this morning. That's pretty exciting, right? Pretty exciting, right? There you go. That's wonderful. Good, good. So, Jeff, tell us who we're baptizing this morning. Hey, how are everybody doing today? We're good? Yeah. All right, so I have my buddy Sal. Come on, Sal. If you know Yale, he, uh, he, he's Mr. Salamander here, right? And this is Yale, and we are very, very excited about the decision that, um, that you made to follow Jesus. So I'm going to pray for us really quick, and then we're going to baptize him, okay? So let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you so much, God, that we come to this place. God, we get to uh, worship you, God, um, and how good you are. God, we're so thankful, Father, that we get to be a place where, um, where people can find God. Um, God, we're so thankful for the Reed family, God, and for their um, praying over, over Yale, God, and for... Um, for all that they've done uh, to nurture this relationship with you. Um, God, we're so thankful, Father, that you've revealed yourself um, to him, and, and God, that you continue to work through him. Um, God, and we pray all these things, your son's holy and precious name. So, this is Sal Reed, and he comes today having accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Is that right? Yeah, awesome. It's because of this profession of faith I baptize you now in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, my God will never fail. My God will never fail. Sing this out. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh. oh, oh. 
this morning? So 
so thankful this morning for just the reminder of who you are. It doesn't matter what we're going through. It doesn't matter where we're at. Lord, if we've strayed away, if we have run from you, that you are always there to welcome us, that you are always there calling out our name, reaching out to us so that we may turn and find you. Lord, you're so patient, you're so kind, you're so loving, and we're so thankful for that. And Father, as we saw somebody walk through the waters of baptism this morning, if there is anyone here, Lord, who is on the fence about surrendering to you, have not given their life to you, Lord, I pray that they would make that decision today. Lord, be with Pastor David as he speaks, Father, and we are so thankful once again to be here this morning. Open our hearts and our minds to hear your word. In Jesus' name. Well, today we're going to continue to talk about this, this theme, this topic, how to grow uh, spiritually in our life. And uh, before we jump into that, I just want to say congratulations to all of our uh, graduates. It's, it's kind of neat to be able to talk today about how to grow spiritually and then also to be able to recognize those who are making their way out of high school, some of you making your way out of college uh, we also have someone on our staff that just finished his master's degree from uh, seminary from B.H. Carroll Theological Institute right back there in the back. You'll see Matt Edwards. Matt, kind of raise your hand. Those of you who are watching on Facebook Live, you can't see Matt, so, but know he's here, and uh, we congratulate Matt on a, on, a, on a long journey to finishing his master's degree, uh, and I kind of wanted to make that little shout out because, you know, I'm, I'm also a B.H. Carroll graduate and teach there, and I'm on the board and stuff like that. So, Matt, congratulations to you. How, how, do we, how do we grow spiritually in our lives? This is, the, this is the topic that Jesus is focusing attention on in this fourth chapter of Mark's gospel. His ministry has begun and crowds follow. Religious leaders are paying attention and they reject Jesus. They literally want to kill him. They want to take him out. It doesn't seem like people can really grasp who he, who he fully is. And, and so really it's a, it's a relevant question here in this fourth chapter at this pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry. And so to explain this, Jesus, he tells a story. He, he gives us a parable. You know, we say that those are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. And he talks about a, a farmer who goes out and he has seed and he just throws the seed and it lands in various places. But he's not talking about farmers. He's talking about what he is doing and what all of us are doing when we're sharing the word of God, the truth of God. And, 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 and trying to answer a question, which is, how come some people get the word, get the message, and say, I accept that. I take that into my life, and I, and I want to grow into all that God wants me to be, whereas other people... They just reject it out of hand. And so Jesus explains this. He says, you know, it's, it's like the farmer that goes out, he throws seed, and some of it lands, he says, kind of on the path, kind of lands on the road. And birds come and they eat it. He thinks he's a farmer, but he's really just a bird feeder. And that may be true of some people's lives spiritually. If they hear the word of God, and, and maybe some people who are watching now, they're you hear the word of God, but it's just kind of in one ear and it's out the other and it's, it's, it's over. But there are others who get a little bit of it. He says they, they, they sort of, they, 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 they develop even kind of a little bit of a root system, but, they, but it doesn't go down very deep because he says the seed falls on the rocky places. And, and so when the sun comes out, life comes out. It just, the, the faith just fizzles. You know, the old saying of faith that, that fails at the last was faulty from the first, that just fizzles out. It just, it just doesn't have any roots to grow. But then he says that there's some, there's some more that lands, and you know what? It's great. It grows. It produces all of this stuff, and it's, and it's really, it's, it's everything that it should be except for there's one problem. It's surrounded by an environment where there are other things growing, weeds and thorns, and they begin to choke out so that it really can't grow and it cannot be productive. It can't actually truly bear any fruit. And I want us to kind of focus on that one because I think that if we're honest in our lives sometimes spiritually, honestly, 
that we kind of fit into that category. A lot of us in this room, you know, we've got our root system in the word, we're, we're invested in God, we're, we're growing in our lives in some ways, but sometimes stuff in life just distracts us to the degree that we just are really not bearing fruit. We've got root, but we don't have fruit. We're here, but we're not necessarily doing all that God wants us to do. Now, I say all that to you because... And I want to just kind of mix metaphors for a moment, because in, in this moment, Jesus is talking about wheats and weeds. But in, in another gospel, in John's gospel, he uses a different metaphor. He uses a metaphor of a, of a vineyard. And uh, uh, vineyards are all over the land of Israel, and they're the other major agricultural product in the land. And, and in John, John's gospel, Jesus says that my father, God, is like a vine dresser. He's like a gardener who comes into the garden of our lives. And Jesus says that he's like the vine. And what the gardener does is he comes in and he has this little thing called a pruning hook. And he just starts cutting away branches that are not bearing fruit. Now he does it, he says, so that the ones that have, you know, the capacity will, will bear even more fruit. I want to show you a picture of this. This is kind of what this looks like. Um, I have no idea how to say any of those words. Uh, I don't have that education, as you know. I'm like in the spiritual religious world, not in the agricultural world, but some of you probably know a whole lot about all that. And, uh, but those are different ways that you can train vines. So what Jesus is talking about there is something everybody understood. They understood that the purpose of pruning was never to hurt or to harm. It was to create an opportunity of more fruitfulness. And so if I could give a title to our message today, even though it's not embedded in this passage in Mark 4, I think it's the application, it would be that we need to be willing in our life to do some pruning. To be willing to get into our lives and to say, even this morning as we're, we've gathered in this time of worship, to look at our lives and say, okay, God, am I producing the fruit that I should be producing in my life? And if not, maybe, God, I just need to let you come inside of my life and begin to remove some things that that may be bad or maybe just not good and that are keeping me from what you want me to do. Now, I say all of that, and now I'm going to read this verse. And you're going to say, what in the world does that have to do with anything you just said? In fact, the verses of Scripture I'm going to read from Mark chapter 4, verses 10, 11, and 12 are among the most difficult to interpret in the entire Bible. So congratulations, you came to church on the Sunday where it's not going to make any sense. Now, hopefully we can make sense of it. It says in verse 10, after he tells them this story, it says, when he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. And he told them that the secret, I'm just gonna let you know that in the original language, this is the word mysterion. We get the word mystery. Some translations even say that, that the mystery or the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. He's saying that to his disciples, like, you guys have got it. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. Now, if you were to go back and read the previous chapter, those people that Jesus said he spoke parables to because they were on the outside were the religious people. They were the religious leaders who wanted him, they wanted to kill him. He says, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. And then Jesus says this, and man, if this doesn't make you scratch your head when you read the Bible... He says, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. What in the world does that mean? Well, I want to try to make this kind of difficult passage not only make sense to us today, but I want, us to, I want, to, I want to show you how it applies right here in your life right now. As Jesus is telling this story he, he, and, and explaining the meaning of it, part of what he addresses in this passage is this thing called the secret or the mystery of the kingdom. And what he wants to do in your life and my life, honestly, is this is, and this is kind of the first thing I want you to grab hold of, so if you're kind of filling out the, the points there on the app, you want to say, you want to write this in there. He wants to remove the mystery of it. He wants to remove the mystery of what all of this is about. Now, 
I got to just kind of caution you for a moment because when, when we read in the Bible the word mystery, which by the way, it's, it's one of the most important bi- words in the New Testament. Paul uses it to describe the gospel. I, I want you to know that the word doesn't mean what it means to us. If I said to you, do you like a, do you like a good mystery? You might say, oh yeah. Oh, I love a good mystery. I love a good mystery novel. I love a good mystery movie. I mean, they're just so intriguing. I I love a good mystery. Who doesn't love a good mystery? The thing, though, about the word mystery in that sense is it's something that we get some clues and we kind of figure out what it means. But in the Bible, as Jesus uses it here, the word mystery is something that we cannot figure out. It is something that is of, if you will, an unsolvable riddle. There's no solution to it. You, you could never understand it. I remember what the, the philosopher, Dana, uh, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard once said, he said, life is a mystery to be lived, not a problem to be solved. And as Jesus is talking about mystery, he's not talking about a mystery that we can resolve, that we can figure out. Like if I just read enough of the Bible, I can figure this out. So what is he talking about? What is, what is this mystery? Well, if, if I could go to Paul and try to give a, an explanation for it, I would describe one of the most succinct verses of Scripture that describes this, and by the way, answers a question we all ask in life. How come some people get the gospel and some people just don't? This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The God of this age... Now, we all know who that is. He's not talking about God with a capital G, the bad guy. Has blinded, and look what word he uses, the minds of unbelievers. And when we hear the word blinding, we think of something that obscures your vision. But here he says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. They cannot see it, not because their eyes can't see it, not because their ears can't hear it, not because they can't listen to this message, not because they can't read the text, but the God of the age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. It's sort of like Jesus' parable of the, of the sower. Now, Paul uses another way to describe this in 2 Corinthians, a chapter earlier, and it's that moment when Moses comes down from the mountain and he has the Ten Commandments. You know, something else happens in that moment. The Bible says that he had been in the presence of God, and he's like looking at God's face, so to speak, but he can't really see his face. And he comes down, and now his face is glowing. And when the Israelites see Moses' face, they don't say, oh, wow, this is so awesome. Let's look on the face of the one who was looking at God. They say this. They say, Moses, would you put on a mask, please? I'm using that kind of as a double meaning, right? But seriously, they say, put on a mask. We don't want to see your face. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. We're not like Moses. That's what Paul says. We're not like Moses, who had put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made Dull. For to this day, the veil remains, by the way, not on Moses, but it's now on them. When the old covenant is read, they're reading the pages of the Bible, but there's a mask in front of their face and they cannot see the glory of God. Look what it says. It has not been removed because only in Christ You see, what God wants to do is he wants to remove the mystery. He wants to remove what is blinding your mind to the reality of the gospel of Christ, to to, to see the light of who he is. But in order to do that, you've you've got to be willing to do that. Now, what does that look like? Well, the negative way to say that is to remove the mystery of it. The positive way to say that is this, to reveal the meaning of it. The opposite of to remove the mystery would be to say, reveal the meaning. Like, what is he trying to say? What is the message he's trying to get across to us? 
And I want you to look back at that verse, if you could, or at least in your mind, to when I read it, in verse 12, when he says that he's telling these parables so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Now, you're reading that in your Bible sometime, and you're just like, Jesus, what are you talking about? Well, you may not know if you're not kind of paying attention, but he's actually, he's quoting the Old Testament. He's actually quoting Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, he's, calling the mo- he's, he's referring to the moment when Isaiah was called by God. We can show you a picture of, of uh, Isaiah. Uh, this is the painting that was done by Raphael, the famous artist. And there's that moment when, 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 when Isaiah is he's in, the, he's in the temple, at least in the vision, and he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe fills the temple, and he's seated upon the throne, and all of the angels are saying, holy, 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 the triagion. And they're giving honor, and, and Isaiah says, I'm, I'm unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't be in the presence of you. And then God asks a question. Whom shall I send? And we remember what, he, what, what Isaiah says. He says, here am I, send me. But do you know what God says next? Isaiah says, okay, God, I'm available. Use me as you would. You know what God says to him next? He says, now, Isaiah, this is what I'm going to do. This is your assignment. This is your job. I am going to send you to a people who have eyes to see, but they won't. They have ears to hear, but they won't listen. Otherwise, they would believe and they would be saved. What, a, what an incredible thing to realize. I remember the first time I ever um, preached on this passage in Mark 4. It was, I could tell you the, the year. It was 2000. It was my first pastorate. I had, I was, I had just started seminary uh, down in Waco, you know, Jerusalem on the Brazos down there. <laughs> down there at Baylor. And uh, I had just started, I had just moved from East Texas where I had grown up, which is, for me, it's more of the Holy Land, you know, than, than, than Waco was. But, and I never wanted to leave East Texas. And I, I remember I, I was preaching on this passage and trying to explain what is being meant here. And I told a story of what had just happened to me that summer. Uh, I had just... I had just graduated from East Texas Baptist University in, 2000, in that year of 2000, and, and over the summer, I had worked at my home church, which is Green Acres Baptist Church in Tyler, and I loved it. I loved it. I loved that summer. I loved being involved in ministry. I don't know if you know that or not, but I, I love ministry. Uh, I, I've always loved being able to serve the Lord. And I, I remember coming to the end of that, that summer, and the moment came when it was like the last day of my job. And the last day of my job, I had to do something I didn't want to do. I had to turn in the key, the key to the building to get in and out. And I remember it was like, it was a tough moment, just tough, just like closing a chapter of my life and beginning a new chapter of my life, I was going to turn in, I had to turn in the key. But in my sermon I preached, I still remember this, 20 years ago, I said, you know, when we're trying to understand this passage and we're trying to understand what he's talking about here, about the mystery and the secret and all that, we need a key. And the key that unlocks not the door of the building, but that unlocks every door in the room of the kingdom of God is a special key. And with that key, you can open hope, and you can find promise, and you can find eternal life, and all the theological words, you can find salvation and redemption and sanctification and justification and just glorification. I mean, we can just do this whole thing. Every door is opened by this. But if you don't have this key, you cannot get in. You just can't. You're an outsider. You say, well, what is this key? Listen to the way the author of Hebrews describes it in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. He says, without faith, it's kind of hard to please God. not what it says is it I mean without faith it's just really difficult to please God not what he says without faith it's not possible it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists now that's not all the verse says that's what a lot of people think it says they kind of go oh well I believe God exists so I have faith but that's not where it ends remember the Bible says like the demons believe 
and shudder? It's not enough today for me to just say, I believe that God exists. He goes on to say this. He says, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. As God the gardener comes to the garden of your life today with his pruning hook, I'm wondering, do you believe that? Do you believe that God rewards those who earnestly seek him? Because if you do, it will change the way you live. If you believe that he rewards those who earnestly seek him, then you will earnestly seek him. And you'll seek him more than other things. And you'll be willing to allow God to come into your life and to remove things that are not earnestly sought after toward him. If we're to back up a few verses in this, uh, this Hebrews chapter, he, he defined faith at the very beginning. He said, now faith is confident, Hebrews 11.1, 1, in what we hope for. And it is assurance of what we, and it's interesting he uses this word, we do not see. We do not see. We can't see it. But that doesn't mean it's not there. In fact, I like the way Paul put it in 2 Corinthians 4. This sermon today could just be called Mark and 2 Corinthians because I keep quoting from there. Chapter 4, verse 18, Paul says, we fix our eyes, we focus our eyes not on what is seen. Now, just think about that. That's actually impossible, isn't it? You cannot fix your eyes on what is unseen. So he's not talking about our natural eyes. But what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary. Look around you in this room. Everything here is temporary. If the Lord tarries a thousand years from now, it's not going to be here. We're not going to be here. Everything on this planet is temporary. But he says, we don't fix our eyes on that. We fix our eyes on what is unseen. Because what is unseen is eternal. It lasts forever. That's what God wants us to do today. He wants us to change the focus on what is eternal. That's what this parable is getting at. It's what God wants us to grow spiritually in our lives. We've got to let him come into our life and, and redirect the attention of our life on what it's supposed to be. And when that happens, at the end of the parable, he says, but the seed that lands in the good soil and it grows, it gets roots and grows, but it doesn't just get roots, it gets fruits. <laughs> it doesn't just grow down, it grows up, and it doesn't just grow up, it grows out. It makes a difference. If I could make, a, make it really make sense today in a Baptist way, it's going to be an R letter, so just get ready. He's gonna re he wants us to remove the mystery. He wants, to us to re he wants to reveal the meaning. But it's going to result in something in our lives. It's going to result in more of it. More growth. More fruit. More maturity. More growing in the Lord. If I could, in just a moment, I want to just give you a few verses just to kind of leave with you to think about this week as we think about what that looks like in our life. And I've just written down a few of them. One of them is in 2 Peter. You'll know this verse. Peter says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> grow, 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 grow. But to do that, sometimes you got to prune. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 6. It's, it, it's appropriate on this week when school's ending for a lot of us around here and some of the people are graduating and everything else is going on. He uses the word elementary things in Hebrews 6. He says, there, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ. Hey, folks, we got to grow up is what he's saying. Be, be taken forward into maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God. Now, I think it's funny. Sometimes the Bible will say, don't be a baby. <laughs> don't be a baby. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but just don't be a baby. If, you, if you're a baby, it's okay to be a baby. But if you're a Christian and you've been a Christian a long time and you're still a baby, that's not a good thing. Except for one time in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, he says you should be like a baby in this way. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk. Hunger for it, long for it, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. 
all the weeds and the thorns and the distractions of life, folks, they're just not as good as they're selling. But when you've tasted that the Lord is good, you should hunger, you should, you, David said in the Psalms, he says, like a deer panting for water in a desert. I am panting for you. Like, like, a, like, like a person longing for the richest of foods in the, in, in, the, in the palaces of kings, I'm hungering and thirsting for God. Is that you today? Is that honestly true for you in your life, that you're hungry and passionate and pursuing God? If you are, then you have the, the ability to grow. And there's one more, one more verse, one more verse. He says in Colossians, a church Paul never visited he said this, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. I wonder what Paul would pray for, for a church he'd never met. I wonder if the same would be the prayer that he'd pray for us. This is what he said he prays for. He said, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. And then he says this, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. You think God wants you to grow today? Yeah, he does. He wants you to grow spiritually. Are you growing today? Is your life moving closer to God? Are you growing in your maturity and your faith? Are you bearing fruit in your life? If you're not... Maybe this morning is a time for the gardener to come in. Invite him. Say, God, come into my life today and, and, and do your work in my heart. Take some stuff out that doesn't need to be there. Prune some stuff away. Or maybe, maybe you're the, the person who's heard the word, but you've never, you've never created a root system. You've never even really begun to grow spiritually. And today's the day of a new beginning, of a new birth. It's not just growth. It's it's birth and you need to do that wherever you are on that pendulum i think god wants all of us to grow spiritually let's pray together and father if we're honest with ourselves and we're honest with you today there's probably not anyone in this room who would say there's not a part of our lives and not an area of our life where we don't need to look at and be examined by you so that we can grow in you. And Lord, if, we, if we're honest, some of us in this room might even say that, and maybe some watching would say, God, that we're not always craving this stuff that will help us grow in you. And so right now, Lord, I just pray that, that you would place in us the desire, the hunger for your word, the hunger for to, to be in your presence, the hunger and desire to, to worship you, to know you, to grow in the knowledge and in the grace of who you are. But Lord, for a lot of us in this room who've, who've developed great roots, some of us haven't developed great fruit. And the truth is, is that a lot of things in our life has become a distraction. There's a lot of attention that's focused on things that are seen and not unseen, things that are temporary and they're not eternal. And right now, God, I just pray your spirit does his work in our heart. Come to the garden of our lives, God. Bring your pruning hook in hand. Help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name.
that we're able to surrender and that you'll, you'll take that on, Father. Father, as we continue to sing, God, my prayer for our church is that we embrace this surrender, Father. That you allow us to fully and completely surrender to you, God. That means getting rid of us and getting more of you, Father. Open our eyes to that, God. Open our hearts to surrender, Father.
Cause your grace holds the ground And your grace holds me now Your grace holds me All right, today is a very special day. Y'all go ahead and be seated for just a second. Uh, today is a very special day. As a student pastor, this is one of uh, my favorite Sundays. This is where we get to honor our graduates, our 2021 graduates. Um, and so we have eight that are going to come, and we're going to recognize them. Um, something really cool about this group is, um, is a few years back, I guess it's been like seven now, but... Um, we started letting sixth graders into the student ministry. And so this is the first group of, of kids that got to be um, uh, in our student ministry from sixth grade to 12th grade. Um, so this is awesome. Uh, we love, I, I really, I really should have. I, I should have, I have some really good pictures, some gems of Belle Wynn and me in sixth grade uh, that I should have put up there. Um, but we both look a little different now. Um, there's one, it's great. Belle was drinking through a sock. It was awesome. But uh, anyways, we... Uh, I'm super, super proud of these students and super proud of, of everything they've accomplished, everything that God has done through them. Um, so we're going to take just a minute to, to honor them. And before we do, I'm just going to pray over them. Um, and so let's pray real quick. Dear Father, we thank you so much, um, God, that you've uh, given these students to us. Um, God, and we thank you for all that you've done in their lives. God, all that you've uh, used the people who are in this room, um, God, to pour into them. Um, God, we we pray now, God, as, they, um, as they, they leave the student ministry, God, that they're not leaving the church. God, they're not leaving the people who've poured into them, but God, that, that they can now just use those things to go out and make a difference. Um, whether they're working or going to college or going to the military, God, that you would, you would use them to make a difference wherever they go. Um, God, that you would use that scripture that's been poured into them, um, God, for them to make a difference. Um, God, we absolutely sing your son's holy, precious name. Amen. All right, so our first graduate is Carly Almazan. All right. Uh, Carly's parent is um, Ms. Flor Rodriguez. Um, and for her verse, she chose Philippians 4.13, which is, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Um, and following high school, uh, she's going to attend the, the University of Texas at Dallas to become an educator. Y'all give her a hand. All right, now we have Mr. Drew Bousquet. Woo, Drew. Sorry, man, they didn't clap as much for you as they did Carly. It's cool. <laughs> uh, Drew's parents are uh, John and Melissa Bousquet. And uh, for his verse, he chose Philippians 4, 12 and 13. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Um, and he is going to attend Baylor University. Yeah. Pastor David can't cheer too loud for you. He just said Tyler was better than Waco. Um, gosh. Uh, all right, Andre Briggs. All right. You got a fan club. All right. This is Andre Briggs. His, uh, his mom is Denise Briggs. Uh, for him, he chose uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verse 9. It says this, resist him, stand firm in the faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Um, and he plans on uh, pursuing a bachelor's degree and then a master's degree, right, in administration. So, um, so Andre Briggs. All right, next we have Mr. Dakota Corp. Just stand right there, Dakota. That way you're not, yeah. Um, uh, this is Dakota Corp. His parents are Paul and Amy Corp. Uh, for him, it's Romans 12, verse 2. It says this, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve of what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Um, after high school, he plans on joining the workforce and also pursuing a bachelor's degree. 
All right, Miss Olivia Grayson. All right, this is Olivia. Her parents are Lane and Brooke Grayson. Uh, her verse is Proverbs 12, 25. It says this, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Um, and she plans on attending Dallas Baptist University. All right, then Mr. Luke McLean. All right, so Luke McLean, his parents are David and Krista McLean. Uh, his verse is Proverbs 19, 21. It says this, many are the plans of man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. And he plans on joining the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> Next, we have Miss Emma Grace Pickard. All right, and Emma, uh, her parents are Griff and Sarah Pickard, and her verse is Isaiah 43, verse 2. It says this, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. And uh, after high school, she plans on attending Texas Tech University. And lastly, we have Miss Bell Wynn. And Bell's parents are Wes and Elizabeth Wynn. Uh, her verse is Galatians 1:10. It says, "I am now trying. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God, or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of God of Christ." Um, and she plans on attending Northwestern State. University, and you're gonna have to pronounce. How do you say that that name of the city? Natchitoches. Natchitoches. All right, cool. I would have butchered that really bad, uh, Louisiana. And I think that's where your mom went, right? Yeah. So little family ties. All right. Uh, and she's gonna do um, uh, journalism, uh, specifically in sports media. So uh, we are very, very excited for Bell. Y'all go ahead and give Bell another round of applause. And then just one more. Let's do it for our, our graduates. Y'all give them a round of applause real quick. Thank you. Again, we are so very excited for them and all that God has um, in store for them. Uh, we're going to continue honoring them with a banquet that we're having just for the families and the, and the students. But we want you to know that um, if, if you have a minute, maybe come and say hi to them and tell them how proud of them you are. Uh, they'll be kind of around, uh, and you, uh, we would love for you to just, you know, um, just give them a pat on the back and tell them how great uh, they are and how great um, the great plans that God has for them. Uh, I'm going to pray for us one more time, and then we'll be dismissed. Dear Father, we thank you so much, um, God, again, for these graduates and all that you have in store for them. Um, God, we pray for this church, um, God, that we can be a church that continues to raise up followers. Um, God, from, from the youngest, from Yale, who we baptized this morning, God, to the oldest, um, God, to Andre, who's graduating, God, we, we, we pray that, um, God, that, that we can be the church that raises up believers so they can be um, prepared to go and make a difference. God, I pray for each and every one of these people in this room, God, that they would find it um, a passion on, on themselves, God, to raise up that next generation of believers. God, I pray that you challenge them with that today. God, we ask all these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. We'll see you next week. You're dismissed.